I put on my best fit, your song got me dancing. I cannot wait to get out the door. We going to the house of the Lord. God, through every season, you give me a reason to see me on my mistakes and wash away my old ways. Now I'm a living testimony of your grace. And God, you give me purpose for I'll be dancing, I cannot wait to get out the door, we going to the house of the Lord. Yo, come on now. Hey, uh, see on the first day I made mistakes, and on the second day I lost my weight, but on the third day I found your grace, and ever since then ain't been the same, ain't been the same, ain't been the same. See I opened up the word and everything started changing, since the beginning, when I was running, I was on your mind despite the life I was living Now I'm a living Testimony of your grace And God you give me Purpose for a brand new day Cause I spend my records on a Sunday Sunday Before I get myself to church I put on my back Whoa! I invite you guys all to stand up, whether you're here or you're online. So glad to see all you guys' beautiful faces again. Let's sing this together. shackled to the way I was Yeah, I'm gonna live like my chains are gone, gone Now my sin is dead and gone And I sing hallelujah Come on, sing it, it's done Done, done He is risen, it is done And I sing hallelujah Shout like the battles won. Fall back, devil, cause your time is up. Yeah, I'm gonna live like the stone is gone.
today, today we're going to learn a new song. Um, and this song talks about just being welcome into God's presence right here, right now. So if you're here right now, then I believe there's a purpose in that. And I invite you guys to just sing this song with me. Let's come on, let's worship. Let's sing. And I'm falling on my knees again in compassion. Another day. 
cry to him I'm coming back to the start I'm coming back to your heart Here and now I'm all in the Lord I want to know you Come on, one more time I'm coming back to the start I'm coming back to your heart
I just invite everyone to close their eyes with me. Lord, this is our prayer right now as a church, as a people, God. That, um, Lord, we just want to go back to the beginning. We just want to go back to that first love that we had for you. Maybe for some of us, that love has died down. Maybe for some of us, that fire has been extinguished. But Lord, we just want to make a commitment today, God, to bring us back to the beginning, Lord. When it wasn't about all the lighting, when it wasn't about all the music, when it wasn't about all the popularity, when it wasn't about gaining acceptance from other people, when it wasn't about our performance and how well we did in front of you, God, but we just ask that you would bring us back to the start, that you would bring us back to the beginning. Come on, can we sing this one last song? I'm coming back. I'm coming back to the start. I'm coming back to your heart. Here and now I'm all in love. I want to know you more. I'm coming back to the start. I'm coming back to your heart. Coming back to the storm. I'm coming back to your heart. Here and now I'm all in love. I want to know you. I'm coming back to the storm. I'm coming back to your heart. Cause here and now I'm all in love. God, we ask that you would bring us back to the beginning, God. Back before everything that was blocking our way, before everything, before all of the distractions, before all of the worries, before all of the burdens, before everything in this world started to form and go against us, God. We just want to go back to you, God. Lord, we ask that you would give us humility, that you would give us the spirit of a child, God. Um, that when we enter your presence, it's not with arrogance. It's not with... Uh, feeling spoiled, feeling entitled that we did somehow deserve you, God. But teach us to come into your presence with a, with a feeling of just being a child at, at their father's feet, Lord. So we ask that in this next moment as we're about to learn a little bit of your word about what you want us to know, God. We ask that you just help us to focus, help us to lock in about what you want us to know, God. That this, is, that this would just be more than just an event, more than just a concert, more than just a fancy speech and a bunch of lighting and good music. But that this would be a breakthrough, that this would be an encounter, that this would be a, a change, that this would be a turning point for some people, that this would be a, a, a moment of restoration, 
that this would be a moment of reconciliation, that this would be a moment of pouring out all of your grace, pouring out all of your favor, pouring out all of your forgiveness in our lives, God. And so we ask those things in faith, God. Lord, we don't want to doubt you. We, we don't want to doubt you, God, but we want to ask you this in faith, God. That if we show up, God, we believe that you also show up. That you are present right in this place, God. So we ask again as we listen to this message, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would just be guiding us. Your Holy Spirit would be speaking to us. Your Holy Spirit would be, would be changing our hearts for the better, God. And so we're so thankful, God. We, 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 we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this moment that we spend with you, God. And we thank you for all these things. And all of God's people say, amen. Before y'all sit down, can y'all look around to your right, to your left, say hi, what's up, good morning, good afternoon, good day. Y'all may be seated. I'm so glad, I'm so, I'm so grateful to welcome all of you back here to Aero Generation Community. Welcome back to a Sunday service here at AGC. Wow, my mic. And I'm so excited. I, I, I prepared this message for a week. Um, I, I actually thought about this message for a long time, a couple weeks, but I didn't know the right week to, to talk about it, but I felt like today was that day, so I'm so excited to talk about a message that I just want to get right into it today. No intro, no nothing. I want to talk about this idea of Christian culture or, or in other words, church culture, right? Um, I know for some of us here, we grew up in the church. Our parents grew up in the church. Um, and while there's so many people that left church, you know, that maybe they grew up in church and they got disappointed. Maybe some of them, they felt betrayed by a church and they just left the church. And they're like, you know what, I, I, I don't need church. I, I don't care about this. Jesus isn't real. God isn't real. And many of them, like, are deconstructing their faith, asking all these questions, which is okay. But to the point where they left their walk with Jesus. For me, I hope for you guys too, I would like to say that I still believe in the church. That I still think that although there may be people that were left betrayed or left broken by the church, I still believe that church works. I still believe that church has a purpose in this life. You know, and, and one time even my friend asked me this. He's like, you know, is it, is it even possible to believe in Jesus? Is it possible to be a good Christian yet not go to church? Like, like I love Jesus, but I just, I just hate church. I, I, I hate the services. I hate the people. They all feel so judgmental. They, 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 they feel like they're looking down on me. I hate the church, but I love Jesus. Is it possible to be in a relationship with Jesus and not attend any church? And, you know, at that time when I, I tried to answer the best I could, and now with a little bit more of thought in, put into it, as, as being a pastor now here, a youth pastor that basically grew up in the church, I think that I've grown, I, I've learned, I've forced myself to appreciate church more and more. Like if, you, if, if you're listening to this and you didn't grow up in the church, I honestly am jealous of you sometimes. You know, because for me, I grew up in the church. My dad was a, is, is still the pastor here. And I, I, I saw everything from behind the scenes, right? I saw how, how there's a lot of problems in the church, how there's so many things to, to to discover how there's so many problems and people rubbing shoulders and not agreeing and people not liking each other. And for people that didn't grow up in the church, they just come on Sunday and see the beautiful service. But for me, I felt like I was the behind the scenes. I saw all the drama. I knew about all the tea. And for me, I never looked at church as what God wanted me to see it as because church is not a building, but church is a people. And the only thing I noticed is that I only grew up understanding church as a service, you know. Oh, oh, I, I, I'm preaching tomorrow. I got I to prepare a sermon. Oh, people, people saw me at church today. That means I, I got to be nice to them when I see them now because they know I'm Christian. And I used to think that church was just a service. Church was just a program. Church was just a lot of different people showing up for like one hour. And that's even if you're on time. One hour. Maybe some of y'all, y'all late 30 minutes. Just 30 minutes every Sunday. And after that, you feel like church is just something that you put on a day. Growing up, I thought church was all about having perfect services being on time for practice, and focusing on what happens in a building. And while I think all of these things are important, I think that many of us that grew up in the church, occasionally we miss the entire purpose, we miss the entire point of church. Like, like I know a lot of us grew up in church, and we, we, we got used to these traditions or, or these, like, these norms that we grew accustomed to. You know, like whenever someone says, God is good all the time, everybody says... And all the time, God is good. Right? Thank you. Or like, you know, we're, we're, we're so accustomed. Whenever we go to church, fast song, slow song, sermon, slow song, 
Judah being sweaty, but you don't know if he's crying or sweaty, a little bit of bull probably offering, then you go home. And some of y'all are like, man, I'm late. I'm going to miss the songs, but at least if I make it to church by the sermon, I'm not late anymore. Or during AG on Saturdays. Y'all know the men of God who are ready for wives were the one that carried the most chairs. And if you didn't carry a lot of chairs, then you weren't ready for a wife yet. Or during worship, you see everyone around you lifting their hands up, crying. You don't even know the lyrics. You don't even know the song. It's more like karaoke, less than worship. You're just looking around. Everyone is crying and you're like, I, I, I guess I'll cry too. I, I guess I'll lift my hands. And you weren't really doing it for the right reasons. You just did it because everyone else did it. And I even remember one time um, someone invited a church to friend. Uh, a church to friend, a friend to church, and that friend was telling them, like, man, like, are you guys like a cult or something? Like, everyone posts the same, like, AG, like, picture on Instagram. Y'all wear, like, the same merchandise, and you guys, like, all look a certain way. You guys, like, are you guys a cult or something? And I told them, no, we're not, we're not, we're not. And, you know, like, I think that we grew up accustomed to some traditions, to some norms of the church, and, you know, and people will find it weird when I repost the things. They're like, man, this is so weird. And I do it because I love the church. And while, whether, while it's funny to talk about all of these, like, small traditions and all these cultures of the church that we've gotten used to, I think that the idea of, of church culture can be hurtful for our relationships with Jesus sometimes. So just hear me out first. I think that these things, that these norms, that these, that these activities that we've grown accustomed to, they can be harmful. They can be hurtful to our relationships with Jesus because we can start to focus on church customs, on church traditions, so much so that we forget that being Christian is more than what happens on Sundays in a building. Like, like before, I used to be so focused on making sure that the Sunday service was amazing, that you guys would, would have an amazing experience. I hope that you guys are having an amazing experience. But that's all I used to focus on. I focused so much on the message to the point that I never realized that God wanted me to seek him just to be with him and not to get a new message or a new idea with him. And so today I just want to read two verses from the book of Romans. If y'all woke up late today and didn't read your Bible yet, say amen. Amen. Two, two verses from the book of Romans that Paul writes as an advice for the church in Rome as well as all of us today. Romans 12, just two verses, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to be reading from the Message Bible. You are going to be listening to me read from the Message Bible. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. This is what Paul says to all of us. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping. A lot of people here love to sleep. You're eating. I, I, I see you people. Y'all love to eat. You're going to work and, and you're walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. You see, I think that's, a, I think that's an important verse right there. It, it's not about how, 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 how fancy of a prayer you can pray for him. It's not about how much tears you cry till it fills up a, a, whole, a whole gallon of milk. But embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. Don't be so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. But instead, Paul tells us this, fix your attention on God and you'll be changed from the inside out. Why does Paul say this? Because for a lot of people during Paul's time and even Christians now, they're only focused about changing from the outside. Looking good on the outside but they never take care of their heart. But Paul says you'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what God wants from you and quickly... Respond to it. Wow. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down into its level of immaturity, God brings out the best of you, develops well for maturity in you. And so I think Paul here says that following Jesus, being Christian, loving Jesus means more than just the one hour that you're at church every day or every week on Sunday. Again, it's one hour if you're on time. But following Jesus is more, it means more. It means offering even your everyday, ordinary life to Jesus. That the point is that Jesus doesn't only deserve your church life, but he even deserves the rest of your life. And so I think the problem with church culture is that we can get so sucked into the services, into the, into the formal church settings, that we forget that Jesus deserves the rest of our lives too. Uh, but what I want to talk about today is actually the second part of the passage that we just read. In the ESV version, Paul says that, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So we are supposed to be transformed. 
We're supposed to be different. In other words, we're supposed to be against the grain from the culture and the traditions of this world. But what I notice is that many Christians, including myself, we try and create such a perfect, such a holy image of ourselves that for non-believers, for non-Christians, it honestly comes off as unattractive and, and just weird. A lot of, for a lot of people that don't believe in Jesus, when they see Christians, they come off as weird. They, they, they almost come off as like quirky. They're just a little, they're just a little weird in the head. They, don't, they believe in all these fantasies, but they're, they, maybe they're all right, but maybe they're not. Like especially online, to be real with y'all, online Christians come off as these, these really weird people. Like these three ways, some of y'all are in trouble because y'all come off as all of these three. Some Christians, they come off as toxic, you know. Like if you ever seen, if y'all ever went on Facebook recently, I cannot tell you how many Christian moms are arguing that the vaccine is from the Antichrist. And if you get the vaccine, you're going to H-E double hockey stick and without even giving a chance to hear out the other side. Like some Christians are so hell-bent in, uh, in Facebook comment sections trying to prove why this should have won the election and that should have happened, but it didn't. And, and other Christians, they come off as cynical. In other words, these Christians don't trust anybody. They feel like they know the truth and everyone is, is a liar. Everything is a hoax. The, the space doesn't exist. We're on a flat earth. And they're constantly disappointed at church. They're, they're constantly ridiculing the government and that nobody knows the truth like they do. And this third one, my favorite, because I see this one way too often. Some Christians online, they come off syrupy. Like y'all ever drink a, a, a soda or, or, or like you ever get coffee and they put a little bit too much syrup in it. Like it's sweet, but it doesn't taste good. Like, like y'all ever see some Christians, they're like a little bit too nice to you that it just comes off as fake. Like, oh my gosh, you are so blessed. I've been praying for you for my entire life. It has been such an honor to be your friend. I am blessed and highly favored. And it's so sweet that nobody can stand the taste and you're not even sure if they live in the real world or not. But I don't think, this, I don't think the problem is online, but I think even in real life too. Like I've talked with a lot of people who are, who are maybe new to church, who, who, who maybe tried church for a couple months or a couple years and they didn't like it and they left the church. And a lot of them were like, yeah, everybody was just so judgy. Everybody was just acting so weird and I felt out of place. I, I, I felt different. I didn't feel like I belonged. And even at AGC, I'm, I am aware and I promise you we are trying to fix that there are some things that we do that make that may make certain people feel uncomfortable, maybe make some of you feel out of place or distant or like you don't belong. And I would, want, I would like to be the first person to say this from this stage, from this position, that I'm sorry if any of you have ever felt out of place. I'm sorry if any of you felt like you didn't belong here. Because I, although I can't speak for other churches at AGC, I promise you that we are trying our best to make you feel like you belong. Because the truth is, you do belong. Uh, and I can confidently say that we are constantly evaluating. We're trying to present a better version, a better image of the church every single week. And so as we talk about this month, this idea in August about going against the grain, I feel like there are good ways that we are supposed to be different, that there are good ways that we're supposed to be weird, but I feel like there are also bad ways that we're supposed to be weird. Like, like there's things that Christians come off as weird that's not right. You, you know, don't get me wrong here. I think that believing in Jesus, when you believe in Jesus and going to church, it's going to be weird for unbelievers. Like when people know that you're Christian, they're like, man, this, the, this dude doesn't believe in science, this is whatever. But I, I want to talk about today is that we shouldn't make Jesus even more difficult for unbelievers by gatekeeping it. By, 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 our, by making it even more difficult to be Christian by our own man-made church rituals and rules. And so the main idea of today's message, if you're, if you're taking notes, you should write this down. Christians are supposed to be transformed, but not come off as quirky, come off as weird. In other words, as followers of Jesus, we are definitely meant to be different and to be transformed. But at the same time, making ourselves weird, making ourselves unapproachable to unbelievers will make it hard for them to approach Jesus. How can they understand that Jesus is accepted when we are so judgmental towards them? So if you're taking notes today, it's out of my sermon, quirky Christians. Ask someone on your right, are you a quirky Christian? Are you a little bit weird in the head? Do, do, are you anti oh, no, I can't say that. So what is the difference? What is the difference between being transformed and being quirky? Well, I think a lot of Christians have heard the saying before, you know, I am in the world, but I am not of the world. They got that plaster on their, on their home. They got that in their Facebook profile. And, and 
How even though we are in this world, we are property of Jesus, we belong in heaven, and heaven is our real home. But I don't think that many Christians, many people understand what this saying really means more deeply. That in many ways, since we are aware and we are submissive that we believe in the gospel, that while we were sinners, Jesus died for us, that we offer him our entire lives like Paul says in Romans. Therefore, when we believe in this gospel, when we believe in its good news, we are going to be different. And like last week's sermon... When we believe in Jesus, we will be hated. We will be ridiculed. We will, we will be punished for that. But the thing is that we are also called to bring non-believers, unbelievers, out of the world's culture and into a higher standard of living. But I feel like that's so hard to do when we set ourselves apart for the wrong reasons. Like, man, you can only be Christian if you dress a certain way. You, you can only be Christian if you believe in certain things. You can only be Christian if, if you post certain things on your social media. And instead of being known for our Christ-like love, is it not sad that Christians today are more known for their stance and for their hatred and for their judgment? And so today, I, I want to talk about this topic very seriously. Weird things, quirky, quirky things Christians do that non-Christians hate. Uh, I'm not one to beat around the bush about topics like this because I think that many churches, many Christians, they pray for new Christians. They, they pray for new people to come into church. But when those new people come, they feel like they don't belong. They make them feel different. They, that many people, we pray for unbelievers to be saved and give their lives to Jesus. But it is impossible to do so when we are so known for other things other than a Christ-like love. You see... While there are times where we will be hated without reason or we will be hated because we love Jesus, I think that there are at least three reasons why we are hated by non-believers that if we fix, we will bring more people to Jesus. So the first thing, number one, you should write this down. First thing that, non, that non-believers, that unbelievers hate, they hate when Christians be judgmental. When It's not like you can go on two... Two minutes on social media, you you can ask anyone around the world, you can ask people that are unbelievers, and the first thing they'll say is, man, I hate Christians because they're so judgmental. And I think the problem isn't that non-believers don't know any Christians, but I think that the problem is that non-believers know lots of Christians who are so judgmental. If you ask anyone about their opinion on Christians, I promise you that one of the most common answers is that Christians are so judgmental. They pass off judgment, they, they put themselves on a high horse, and they feel like everyone is worse than them. That you can't go on two minutes on social media without seeing Christians and even pastors condemning, judging, pointing fingers, blaming other people just because of the color of their skin or even lifestyle choices. And if I'm being honest, the presence of judgment When you judge people, the presence of judgment almost always guarantees an absence of love. Let me say that one more time. Maybe it didn't stick in your head the first time. The presence of judgment almost always guarantees an absence of love. It is impossible to judge someone and love them at the same time. It's impossible to truly love anyone if you're so busy always judging their every move. And I think the first step to be less judgmental is to admit it. Why? Because I think very few people are judged into following Jesus and far more people are loved into following Jesus. And I'm not going to stand up here on the stage and call you guys out for your mistakes because I think even for me, I, I think my job is here is to admit it first. That without the guidance of the Holy Spirit, without Jesus helping me, I am so judgmental. Part of the fact is that psychologically all humans were created, were wired in a way where we like to categorize things. And while it's okay to categorize your favorite fruits, I think that it can be very hurtful if you try to categorize people. That you try to put them in a box and you try to judge them by this one thing. While, you know, and maybe you're like, well, what if they're actually making a mistake though? Should, shouldn't I let them know? Like, 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 shouldn't I judge them in that case? And sometimes that's actually the case. And to that I would say, if you want to tell people their mistakes, first look at yourself. Look at the mirror. Look at your own sins, your own mistakes. That if God would be willing to forgive your mistakes over and over and over again, the question is, would you be willing to forgive that person's mistakes? Instead of correcting them with the intent and with the intention to judge them, you would give them advice with the intent to love them. Like, Like just imagine, 
Just imagine if Christians stopped judging other people, if they stopped judging the world and left that up to God. Let God judge the world and let Christians love the world. You know, because the truth is, I don't think anyone here likes to be judged. And no one will ever get judged into following Jesus. But far more people will get loved into following Jesus. So the second thing, second thing that Christians do that non-Christians hate, number two, unbelievers hate when Christians be hypocritical. In, 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 in short, being hypocritical is saying one thing but doing another. And the truth the truth is that it's so much to call other people hypocrites than to admit it yourself. It, it's so to say, man, he preached, but he doesn't even do that in his own life. Man, she, she's a teacher, she, she's a minister, but she doesn't even do that in her own life. And the truth is that we are all hypocrites. Someone on your left, hey, you a hypocrite too, bro, I love you. As much as I hate to admit this, I am even a hypocrite. My walk, the way I live my life sometimes does not always match my talk. Like, have you ever seen me play Fortnite or 2K21? On my PlayStation, no, you didn't. That's why my, my, like, if you add me on PlayStation, it's not like Jesus Freak 316 or God loves you. You know, because sometimes I get upset. And, you know, when I beat them, the discussion starts to center about the topic of the taste of macadamias and cashews. Or it will be about giving my opponents kisses. But, if, uh, but what I'm saying is that it gets worse than me just playing games. I'm not always a good son. I'm not always a loving friend. I'm not always a perfect pastor. And just like the rest of you here, I am a mixture of slightly good and very, 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 very bad. Which is why the process of this thing that we call sanctification is so important and it never ends. You see, when we choose to follow Jesus, our lives aren't magically turned around or magically fixed and we we become perfect. But through the faithful guidance, through, through the process that the Holy Spirit puts us in, we are slowly being transformed into more and more of who Jesus wants us to be. And I feel like the first step to being changed by Jesus is to admit your mistakes. Owning your sin, admitting your sin is very different from living in it. In other words, confession is never an, an excuse for complacency. Confession, confessing your sins is never an excuse for you to become complacent in your sin. So simply, what I'm trying to say is that don't pretend to be someone that you're not. The way to be less hypocritical is to be more humble with your words and to be more intentional in your actions. If, if like me, if you've noticed that your walk doesn't always match your talk, the solution is not to fix your walk or your talk. It's to fix both. The, in other words, the easiest way to be less hypocritical is to humble your talk and accelerate your walk. Non-Christians, they hate when Christians are judgmental. They hate when they're hypocritical. And now the third thing. Here's something else, my favorite point, that Christians, that Christians do that non-Christians hate. Number three, unbelievers hate when Christians are unavailable. What do I mean by that? Are you making yourself available for relationships with unbelievers? Are you making yourself available for relationships with people that don't think the way you do? The truth is that very few Christians actually pursue meaningful relationships with unbelievers. Instead, many of us, we are happy living in our own small Christian bubble. We love when everyone loves Jesus and believes in us, and we only surround ourselves with people that think like us. And although that's not wrong, we have to reach out to unbelievers. We only, some of us, we only want to surround ourselves with those who speak life to us, but we never want to speak life into the lives of non-believers. Are we, are, are we really selfish? Are we really that selfish to keep the freeing nature of Jesus Christ to ourselves and to never tell it to other people? For many non-Christians, the only way that they interact with the church and with Jesus are situational, you know, in, in certain situations like the pandemic or observational rather than truly relational. A lot of non-believers, they only learn about Christians when they see churches do absolutely nothing to years of police brutality towards black and brown people. A lot of non-believers, they only learn about Jesus and the church when they see that people have to create uh, organizations and events to support local communities during COVID since churches aren't doing enough. You see, if we read our, Bi- if we read our Bible in great detail, we would realize that Jesus pursued relationships with people who were different from him. And for us here, we have to do the same thing. So the question, it comes back to us. Are we creating relationships with people who think differently than us, dress differently than us, believe in different things than us, 
have different values than we do. And maybe for other people here, maybe for some of us, we actually already do that. Maybe we do have a lot of non-Christian friends. But do we ever want to talk about Jesus with them? Are we too scared to bring up this idea of Jesus to our friends because we'll, we'll think that they'll think of us as weird or anything? You know, often when Christians do pursue relationship, when, when they do try and create a relationship with non-believers, it's more of a project than an actual relationship. What do I mean by that? Like, man, this is my non-believing friend. I'm going to do whatever it takes to make them believe in Jesus. And we kind of feel like we bear the responsibility. We want to, when we want our friends to be saved without realizing. Some of us, we put ourselves on a pedestal and look at that person as our job or our duty. Spencer James, we carry the burden of saving our friends on ourselves. But do you want to know the truth? The truth is that people are not projects and we are not their saviors. Say that one more time. People, unbelievers, our friends that we truly love and care about, they are not projects and we are not their saviors. People are people and only Jesus could save them. And specifically for those of us who are in ministry, at the church, who serve, who love the church so much that we dedicate time to it. People should not be used to simply, to simply expand our ministries at church. People should not be used to build up the ministry. The ministry should be used to build up the people. But as Christians, I think what we don't do enough of is showing them how Jesus changed our lives. So the way to be more available in relationship with unbelievers is to simply be real and to start with your story. A lot of people, a lot of Christians, they love coming up as syrupy, that you're so sweet, but it's so sweet that nobody enjoys the taste. That, that you try to paint your life as an amazing, perfect story when in reality, your story isn't perfect. But God can still use those broken pieces to mend and to say a perfect gospel. That the best miracle that you can show other people is your life. So can I ask the worship team to come up? To summarize today's sermon, it's titled, Quirky Christians. Y'all like the Olivia Rodrigo sour font? Christians are supposed to be transformed but not come off as quirky. So three things that Christians do that non-Christians hate. Number one, be judgmental. The presence of judgment almost always guarantees an absence of love. You cannot judge people and love them at the same time. And that the first step to being less judgmental is to admit it. It's to be honest. Why? Because very few people are judged into following Jesus and far more people are loved into following him. Number two, non-Christians hate when Christians be hypocritical. That it's so much easier to call other people hypocrites than to admit it ourselves. And the truth is that we are all hypocrites. That the easiest way to be less hypocritical is to humble your talk and to accelerate your walk. Can I invite you to stand up with me? And number three, non-Christians hate when we are not available for them. The truth is that very few Christians actually pursue meaningful relationship with unbelievers. And even when Christians do pursue relationship with non-believers, it's more of a project than an actual relationship. And the truth is that people are not projects and we are not their saviors. And so as we're about to enter a time of worship after this, I'm going to read again the verses we read. Romans 12, verse 2. This time I'm going to read it in the ESV version one more time. This is what Paul writes to all of us. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. That the idea is if we want to be transformed by Jesus, we need to be transformed through our minds. Through the inside out. A lot of us, we're only focusing on changing our actions. We're only focusing on looking the part, but we never focus on what God wants to do in our hearts. That God doesn't want us to be transformed through actions or through words or through empty behavior, but through our minds. So let God renew your mind. Yeah. You may have identified with this message this whole time, but the truth is that if you're feeling down on yourself right now, like I did when I was making this message, the truth is that God gives us another chance to change today. Maybe all you need to do is to put the spotlight off of your own goodness and put it onto the perfection and the holiness of Jesus Christ. So can y'all close your eyes with me? I, I just want to pray with you all before we enter this time of worship, God. Lord, we just, we just thank you for this message, God. Maybe for a lot of us, we've, it's true, like, it's true. Maybe 
Maybe we come off as weird. We, we, we make the gospel even more difficult to accept for other people because we make it with our own traditions and, and our own rituals and our own norms. But today, God, we ask that you take the spotlight off of us and put it onto your holiness, God. That somehow, some way, that you would use us for your glory and your glory alone. That you would help us to focus on your holiness, on your perfection, and let that shine through our lives. Lord, we are sorry if we've ever used your name for our own benefit. We are sorry if we've ever abused what it means to be in a church, if we've ever hurt people out of the church, if we've ever been betrayed, or if we've, if we've been the ones who've betrayed other people so much so that they've left you, God. Lord, we just want to admit our brokenness. We just want to admit our sinfulness, God. Lord, we are sorry. Lord, we are sorry, Lord, if we've made this all about us. We are sorry if we've hurt people out of the church. If we've judged people by no ends. If we did exactly the opposite of what you call us to. Instead of, instead of loving people, Lord, we're sorry when we've judged people. We're sorry, God, if we've been hypocritical. We're sorry, Lord, if we haven't been making ourselves available for a true relationship, God. So we ask, Lord, in your presence right now, in your Holy Spirit, that you would renew us, God. That you would give us a second chance, Lord. That you would help us, God. Can we sing this together? And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. And show me who you are and fill heart and lead me in your love to those around me. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in one. Show me who you are and fill together and I will build my life and I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken Why? 
as we've been in this sermon, God. Lord, we would just ask that you would make this more than just, just a sermon, more than just a message in our lives, God. That you would help us be your hands and your feet, God. Loving other people just the same way that you've loved us. Lord, remind us that you did not judge us. You did not look at us as outsiders. You didn't think of us as any different than your own son. And Lord, if you would accept us, if you would forgive us by your grace, teach us to use that grace to accept and forgive other people, God. Teach us that it is impossible to love you if we can't love your people. Lord, remind us that your destiny, your calling is for everyone to be saved. That you don't pick and choose. You, you don't cherry pick people. You, you, you don't make people change and come to you, God, but you ask us to be in your presence and then we will be changed from the inside out. So teach us, Lord, to lean on your holiness, to lean on your perfection and make you the foundation of our lives, God. Lord, we are so sorry if we've thought of church as nothing more than just a tradition, as nothing more than just a ritual, as nothing more than just a culture as nothing more than just one hour that we show up on Sunday. But teach us, Lord, that church is a people that you desire for all of us to be in church. You desire for all of us to be in community. Lord, you desire for all of us to be in communion with you, God. And so that's our prayer today. If that's your prayer today, can I invite you to lift your hand up? Lord, you see all these hands that are lifted, God. We want to dedicate our lives where you're called. We want to be your church. We want to be your hands. We want to be your feet. We want to love other people the same way that you've loved us, God. And so we're asking for an outpouring of your mercy. We're asking for an extra blessing. We're asking for an extra outpouring of your forgiveness. We're asking for an outpouring of your grace on our lives. We're asking for an outpouring of love. We're asking for an outpouring of renewal. We're asking for an outpouring of restoration, Lord, that you would use us, God, that you would mold us, Lord, that you would make us be more and more like your son, God. Lord, we ask all these things in faith. Lord, we don't, we don't doubt you anymore. We don't want to ask these things in, in, in confusion.
worship, but we want to ask you these things in faith. We want to ask you these things in 100% belief that you will come through, that you will follow through, Lord. Come on, let's say this one more time. Holy. In holy, there is no one like you. out of our comfort zone, to step out of our own arrogance and our own selfishness, keeping Jesus to ourselves. But Lord, help us to show that Jesus was the best decision that we could ever make, that Jesus was the best thing that happened in our lives. Lord, we would ask that you faithfully guide us, Lord, as we are helping to bring more and more people to your name. Lord, we want to pray for the city of Philadelphia. We want to pray for our community around the church. We want to pray for the, for, the, for the country of America. We want to pray for the world, God, that you would have an outpouring of grace, that you would hope and that you would help people have a new revelation of who you are, God, that all of us here would strip down, that, that we would let go of our own understandings, that we would let go of our own compromises, that we would let go of our own emotions and our own feelings and lay it down at your feet, God. And so as we thank you for this message, God, we ask that in this next moment, God, that if you would move any of us to support AGs financially, that you would remind us that it's more about how we give than what we give, God. That you love a joyful giver, Lord. And that most of all, more than any of the treasures, more than any of the time or the energy or even the devotion that we can give you, Lord, we want to give you back our hearts, God. We want to give you what belongs to you, which isn't just tithing 10%. But we want to give you back 100% of our hearts, God. And so we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this revelation. We thank you for this reality that we are being more and more accustomed to, God. That we are made to be transformed. That we are made to be against the grain. 
that although people will think of us as different for believing in Jesus, Lord, we wear it proudly. Yeah. Lord, we want to boast in you proudly. Yeah. We want to boast ourselves as followers proudly. Teach us not to be ashamed. Teach us not to feel guilty for being Christian, but teach us to be proud that you've chosen us, Lord. Yeah. So we thank you for all these things. In the name of Jesus, everybody say amen. 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 Y'all may be seated for a second. As you guys are preparing your offerings, you can hold on to it, and then you can put it in the offering box on your way out. We have a little bit of announcements for you guys. So again, we want to appreciate all of you guys that came to the service today. We want to thank you guys for making your way out, whether in person or online. And just a couple of announcements. If you would love to join us again next Sunday at 12 p.m. for another Sunday service, please do not forget to register at register.erageneration.org. I'm not watching you, but God is watching you if you register. If, if not that, then we also have our Wednesday Bible studies at 7 p.m. If you want to join us on Zoom, you can just look up the password and, the, and the, all the meeting info for Zoom on our Instagram. And if you guys are not a part of our AGL, which in other words is our life groups, is places and little communities where we get to spend life together, where we get to do and seek God together, then you guys are more than welcome to reach out to a home team member on your way out. But other than that, I invite you to stand up one more time as we're going to sing one more song. Sing this one last song and end this sort of strong, all right? Thank you for the service, God. We thank you for, the, for this moment, for this, for this newfound understanding that we could find and this newfound, newfound peace that we could have in you, Lord. We ask that although AGC is about to be over, God, that your presence in our lives would never be over, Lord. That your blessing, that your, that, that your presence, that, that your forgiveness, that your mercy would be everlasting in our lives, God. And so we hold these things as truth. We hold these things as our reality that we live in, Lord. So we thank you for all these things. And all of God's children say, Amen. Amen. Maybe seated the home team will escort you guys out. We'll see you next week. Woo. Bye.